You're listening to another episode of Bufia Bruja. I'm Bex Carlos, your host. For today's episode, I'm really excited. So you might remember back, I had Tia Maria on, and we had this discussion about how, like, you know, when you find magic, when you put your energy out into the world, people who resonate with what you're doing will find you. So for today's episode, I have Vanessa Godornil. She is the Biz Bruja. And, you know, she has been in these spiritual circles for a long time, Free the internet. So that's pretty accomplished in itself. And we talk about all of the things that are important to align with yourself, to really figure out your purpose, and putting that message out there. I'm just going to stop talking and let her tell you all about it herself. Vanessa, thank you so much for being on the show. Yay, I'm so glad to be here, Bex. (laughs) It's funny. You, I believe, had heard me on Café and Consejos, right? When I was a guest on her show. Yes. Which I just love because we were just having that conversation, Maria and myself, like we were talking about how like, once you put your Bruja energy out there and connecting with other people who really just have the same vision, people find a way to find you. And it's wonderful. Yeah, no, I thank you. I love it. I love that we're doing this. I love that we're flowing this way. I love that we dip our toe out there and the waves and the ripples go in el agua and we reach each other in the wind or however it flows, you know? Do you mind kind of introducing yourself to everybody who might not be familiar with you or your work? Yes, thank you, thank you. So yes, Vanessa Codornu, and I go by the Biz Bruja. For many years, like 16 years, I went by the Urban Priestess, but we'll get into that in a moment. I am a third generation on one side, fourth generation psychic medium, and, you know, espiritismo, espiritista background in terms of just being part of the Catholic energy that I was marinated in as a kid. I'm someone who started reading people at 16. And then I said I lost my powers because I didn't want to read adults anymore in their business. And I was like, can I be a teenager, please? And from then on, I wrote a letter to my guides and they just spoke to me from that moment. And I mean, they didn't let me be a young person in many ways, or at least I chose to listen to them. So I didn't go through a lot of the fun stuff that people go through in their late teens and early 20s, because at that point, my guides were already training me in so many different ways. And so I am an intuitive psychic, a trained clinical hypnotherapist, a Latinx bruja. I am an energy healer, Reiki master and four different paths. And I have held circle in my New York City apartment monthly for 20 years, for almost 14 years for free. Everybody brought food and trust, even though it was not a big apartment, like 30, 40 people were squeezing in there and we had to get create a wait list. And at some point in time, I realized that I was just showing up the way I was raised in that we believed in dreams. We had guides. We didn't publicize it. My parents and my grandparents were not reading other people publicly or anything like that. But it was a way of life where we knew that spirit was backing us, that we had ancestors. There was an ancestor shelf in Altar. And at some point, it became very evident after years and years of trainings and apprenticeships in shamanism. I've sweat lodged for 20 years, like every year. Being initiated as a priestess at 22, it became so evident. It was evident to everyone else, but not me. I really ran from it. Like right now, everybody's running to be a public bruja. Everybody's running to be a tarot reader, a healer, discovering it, rediscovering it. I've been doing it for, you know, over three decades, but I fought it. And at some point in time, I totally, completely embraced it. And my specialty is that I help people connect to their intuition and heal their ancestral patterns and ancestral traumas, right, and experiences so they could really rise in their life and in their business. And I created a school called the School of the Healing Artes. I've been teaching offline for two decades and have been online full-time supporting myself with my work, teaching from the get-go, but I never actually gave it a name. So during the pandemic, the School of the Healing Artes came up and I wanted it like that. And it's really designed to support the next generation of BIPOC and Latinx healers and leaders and conscious folks. And so really that's kind of in a nutshell, the work that I do. And so there's trainings in the school and individually Akashic Record readings, ancestral hypnosis healing and business coaching. So first of all, that's very accomplished. And I think that something that you said that stood out that you were priestess at 22, I'm like, shook. (laughs) That's so cool. But 
that goes to show that, you know, you were in a space where you were very much able to trust your intuition, really, you know, have the support of people around you. And I think that so many people think that, you know, if you practice something just outside of Catholicism, that it's evil, there's something wrong with it. I think people are just so unaware and ignorant and really just like to hide behind their faith and what they know. You know, they're just afraid of the unknown. Yeah, well, a lot of internalized oppression, colonization. I mean, we know this, right? Generations and generations of us being demonized and indigenous and African and across the world, not just African, indigenous and European, Siberian, all of this ancient wisdom, we have it within us. And so many people are scared. They're terrified. I've had some clients whose family like isn't talking to them just because they're claiming their brujita powers, you know? It's sad. I know that there are brujitas that combine Catholicism and that's fine. I mean, I like the cultural aspects, but like as a practice in my faith, like I don't do it. It doesn't resonate with me. And I think maybe just because I have a really bad relationship with it. And I feel like, you know, going to the practices that reconnect self with the universe, I think, you know, if that's considered finger quote bad, then I guess I'm a bad person because I'm like, if nothing else, I feel like I've come here to one, set an example and heal myself and help others. And I think that that's really what we're here for, you know? to figure our own shit out, and then bestow that wisdom on other people. Yes, I totally agree and to hold space so people could remember who they truly are, right? You know, growing up in a home where I could talk about things uh, or was supported to read was beneficial until, you know, you see things that your family doesn't want you to see, and then you call it out. And then you have problems. And even though they were supporting in the spiritual gifts and they knew it because my mom went to readers who were like, leave her alone, you know, because I used to sleepwalk at night and scream and cry like somebody was burning me and stamp on my bed. And my mom knew not to wake me. I mean, I don't think you're supposed to do that. At least that's what she thought. She went to a priest. She went to a healer. She went to a santero. She went to different people. And they were all like, your daughter's going to be doing spiritual work from a young age. Leave her alone. She's got to find her way. But my parents did not want me to do this work, by the way. Just to be clear, because of generations of hiding it, though they talked about it to some degree, or they were receiving messages from people who crossed over, it was not public. It was not public at all. And to be frank, when I went to Argentina, I was born in Peru. My family's from Argentina. When I went at 19 with this recording from a cassette about past lives, I was so scared and terrified to talk to my grandparents about it. And I sat down. I'm like, abuelito, abuelito. Oh, my God, I tengo que decir algo. I have to tell you something. Like, I was so scared. And I told them. And my grandfather laughed, called my grandmother. And he's like, listen, she thinks she invented this spiritual connection thing. And I'm like, no, I didn't. And they started telling me all their stories. They had not shared them with me until I came to them. And other cousins that I know never knew anything about it. So there was still levels of secrecy. And no one wanted me to do this work because they were afraid that I would be stuck in a room with tons of candles, you know, breathing in (laughs) all the candle exhaust, right, all day long. Because that's like an old time, an old time healer, at least in New York City, right? I used to go and they have a little room or a closet and they have surrounded by candles of people that they're praying. They got the huevos going on. They got the ruda. They got other things. And my parents were like, oh my God, that you're going to be in a house with candles all around you, not get married. The dark side's going to come after you. So there's so many levels, right? I also think that there should be some credit for like people who can adjust with the times. Like, cause my parents were a lot more Catholic back in the day. And I feel like them and their efforts in decolonizing, which very much I have pushed upon because you know what? No one tells you that if you're the one who has to break the generational curses, it's not as fun as you think. <laughs> you're going to gain a lot of power and self, you know, you're going to be unstoppable. You're going to be free in ways that nobody can hurt you because you've already named all your demons, but nobody tells you that that sucks. <laughs> No, it does suck, Bex. And it's like, I, as a older sister, older Latina sister, you're not supposed to move out unless you get married. And I moved out. I was at NYU School of the Arts and I wanted to move out. My parents cut me off financially. I had a 4.0. I love school. It was to force me to come back home. And my guides were like, no, stick your ground. And I'm like, Bill, you'll be able to go back. Nah, I did not go back to that school. I went back years later and finished, but it was really painful. 
to hold my ground and be like, no, I am 20 years old and I've got to find my own way, you know, and I forgave them in time and they're both passed now this past year, but, and I'm not mad at all at that, but yeah, it's not fun. It's not fun at all. Something that I just remembered because it's been really pinging in my head, like in a way that like an epiphany that really like shakes you to your core. The most violent element or tool, I guess, in white supremacy is shame. Yeah. Because if you think that something shameful, whether it be like your practice, whether it be like your children's lifestyle, whether it be like whatever, what have you, that's always going to make you doubt yourself and doubt, you know, the situation, you know, what's going on. And we can only hope that we are surrounded by loved ones who care and are willing to grow with us as we, like I said, decolonize. Totally. I totally. And you're right. And, you know, I think if our loved ones also begin to understand that it wasn't always like this you know even if we want to connect with the energy of jesus or not like jesus is very separate from religion it's just a different thing and that religion is man-made you know it's created if they would understand that then they could be more at ease right and even right supposedly he said that we could do what he does right that all these things that he's doing these miracles So he spoke to folks about their inner power. So maybe our parents, our grandparents, our tío tías be like, hey, I'm not dissing your Jesus, you know? It's just like the walls that were built around it are pretty harsh, so. That's so true. And something I need to remind myself, I think, of more regularly. So with this year kind of wrapping up, if you were to describe this year in one word, what would it be? Oh, let me see. I picked a word before this year started, which was, victorious or victory i don't even remember i feel like it's challenging the victorious or i don't know there's so many words transformative challenging i don't know if everybody feels this way for me it feels victorious and i think that it's been a invitation to face our shit right to really face our fears face our limitations or either the ones that we've had imposed upon us or the ones we've integrated in our you know, have a little lives of their own that we need to like meet in the dark, do a little dance and either bring them over to our side or transform them somehow, you know? It's all about growing and becoming our best in selves, you know? And uh, I'm with you. Like, I think before the cast, we both said a word. And I think now it's like testing because I think that we as individuals, for better or for worse, we don't always think about our limits or, you know, we don't think about like the things that we can deal with. Not that we should have to deal with them. You know, I think that there are things that really, you know, just because you can deal with them doesn't mean that you should. But I think that there's something to be said about our ancestors had to survive. They had to figure out ways to keep going. When I think about all the things that all my tias and tios and like abuelos and like bisabuelos and all that stuff that they had to deal with, it just, it really opens my eyes sometimes. It was all a building process and your ancestors brought you here so you can figure out the next step. Totally with you, Bex. Totally with you. At one point, so in March, I lost all my clients almost within a week in my coaching because they lost their jobs or their partners lost their jobs. And I sat there and I went in, you know, into my circle and I just called the spirits, spirit and my ancestors and said, well, what do I do next? And I don't teach Reiki online, you know, it's part of my journey. I use it every day. I was guided to hold free gatherings every Monday doing journeying and sending Reiki long distance and talking about the astrology for free. And then I was guided to do a pay what you can Reiki, right? These are not, I don't do a free thing every week in that manner. I might do a reading, a video, something. I wound up doing it for three months. And in that time, so many people from so many places came from Latin America, from the UK, from Europe, Italy and Spain stuck, you know, over there telling us what it was like. And during the time, that wisdom that you just shared was like, we carry within our veins this um, incredible, resourceful strain of goodness because we're here. That means they survived. And so we're more resourceful than we know. We're more capable of being flexible than we know. And we're more capable of recreation, rebirth, and creation, period. But it's shaking up a lot of people. I was already online for eight years, even though I lost my clients like, overnight in that way. I'm used to being really creative and creating something fast. But for a lot of people who lost their work, or that's just not their path, it's you know, they've studied other things. It was challenging in many ways. This year was definitely about ending a lot of cycles. You know what I mean? And I think that sometimes we 
participate in cycles that really just don't benefit us anymore. And for I know a lot of people like their relationship with capitalism was definitely something that was at least, you know, they something they thought about with the state of of the world. Yeah, I just hope that everybody did some, you know, deep soul searching and had some goodness come out of the year. Totally. And you know, even just as we come towards the end of the year, just finding that space within ourselves and asking, um, you know, what has been released, because sometimes we're not even conscious. Some of us are conscious, some of us aren't, you know, aware of it, because we just did it. We're like, well, I just lived it. (laughs) And it's like, yeah, but what did you really release? And also, you know, what gift were you given? Because for some people, they got the gift of solitude, or they got the gift of peace, or the gift of not being able to run away and go out and hang out anymore. So they had to look at themselves and decide that they have different goals now, right? Or that they wanted to heal. May everyone be working towards their better self. Speaking of working on things, do you have any new projects that you're working on? So yeah, I'm working on a couple of different things. I was talking about the School of the Healing Art of This earlier, and it's on Mighty Networks. And it's really one of the things that I'm inviting people into. There's a membership that I'm creating, a monthly membership. And you know, it'll be a monthly gathering, and it'll be a mini class. And I love holding space for community where there is discussion, where we are supporting each other, where we're learning from each other, not just like one person, you know, lecturing at us or anything. And uh, because each and every one of us is a leader, is a healer, is an intuitive in some way, shape or form, we carry spirit within us. So that's a way. And if anybody's interested in finding out more about you know, Akashic Records or Reiki or developing your intuition. That's some courses that I house in that school. I wanted to bring something up. We were talking about, you know, our paths. I came to being, let's say, a priestess. And I, by the way, I initiated into Wicca, I know, at 22. So I was like raising some Espiritismo. I went to temple because like we wound up moving near like a lot of Jewish temples. Suddenly I became friends with kids who were Jewish. And I was like, well, you know, where am I going to go? Let me go figure this out too. I would say that whatever time that, you know, we awaken to our gifts is perfect for us. And I would say too, like, that wasn't perfect either. Like going into a coven and training, there was so much matriarchal ego. And it's like, I don't want to get on my knees and kiss a sword of patriarchy. I also don't want to kiss the sword of matriarchy. And so I kind of came to realize that that wasn't a structure for me. And so I know that there are a lot of purists and traditionalists. They're like, no, if you don't stay at a coven, then you're not this. Or if you don't do this, I really feel like we've stepped into an era where we're claiming ancestral wisdom that can be from many cultures, many places, and that that works. You know, I could do a limpia with a huevo, which is more indigenous, taught by my grandmother, but then I could turn around and call the directions in a very Celtic way. And I don't feel like there's anything wrong with that. And I can ask that Yamayan Oshun bless me, right? And I feel okay with that. Again, there'll be traditionalists who hear this or people who are a little more strict with their rules. I feel like you can be an eclectic brujita or an eclectic witch or whatever you want to call it because we've lived before and our ancestors from different places, you know? It's funny. I was actually just having a conversation last night with one of my friends who he's a black man and he is really into anime and he's always just found it to be very difficult to find spaces that feel welcoming to him. And I relate because, you know, growing up in the Midwest, I was a Mexican chick who was into punk rock. I had to remind him, I was like, we make people uncomfortable because they're not used to us. Like, you know, like, and there's something about being able to just shed things that no longer benefit you being able to shake off like vibes and really just being able to hold space for yourself especially like a lot of us who you know have that duality of mexican american or cuban american or argentinian american whatever what have you you do enjoy things from the united states but you also love things from like your your homeland wherever that might be and it's okay to like both. It's okay to get down with the things that make you happy and that, you know, give you joy. And I think that at the end of the day, yeah, like I said, it's really when people don't like it or have to like put you down or whatever, it's because you just make them uncomfortable. That's not your problem. It's their problem. Totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. And that space for wholeness also includes all parts of ourselves, right? And, um, and I know, and that's part of how I wound up changing to the Biz Bruja. So I was the urban priestess for 16 years in New York City. And then I think it was a year ago that I kept hearing the business bruja, business bruja. And I was like, no, guides, no, no, leave me alone. I'm already known as the urban priestess, leave it alone. And and I kept hearing the business bruja, business bruja. And then I settled into it. And it was like this bruja. 
And it was like, bruja. And I was like, oh. And, you know, since I'm a little girl, my mom called me brujita mia, mi brujita. And I was like, I just have to embrace it and stop. Uh, my first podcast was about that. And I'll be honest with you, like, even though I can try to feel comfortable in many different spaces, I actually feel the most, most, most comfortable in places where I can hop back from English and Spanish, right? Because it speaks to, like, soy de aquí, no soy de aquí. I'm from here, I'm not from here. Like, born in another country, come here at the age of one, figure out college on your own, life on your own in some ways because your parents are still getting the hang of it or learning English. Um, and I just realized that about me, I was like, yeah, I can accommodate or adapt to certain environments, but I really love being able to go back and just jump back and forth. I don't know if this ever happened to you, Bex, but like in some spaces, I, like in most spaces, I don't feel completely that I fit in. Like I'm really super happy that this is more, we're talking about espiritismo, spirituality, you know, being a bruja now in that way. But also like if I go to Argentina, I'm not a straight up Argentine either. I have different ways of looking at things. I And I'm not downing anybody who lives with their parents, by the way. I'm not used to that level of staying with your family till you get married, right? Which can happen anywhere. And, you know, during financial strife, that's what we do. But I'm just saying, as also an Americana in New York, I was like, no, nah, I want to do my own thing because I want to live my life. I agree with you uh, to an extent. Because I think a lot of people, like, not that this is the instance that you're in, but I think a lot of people, the reason that they also feel like they have to go and, and like live their own life is because they feel they can't be their authentic selves around their like family, which is such a terrible, unfortunate thing for a lot of people. Yeah. Like I'm so blessed that, that the family that I have is my family because we're all just kind of eccentric and quirky and we just do things. And it just like, is funny. There's a song I think, and I could be wrong. I think it's a Mexican like pop song, but it's like, uh, I viene la plaga. Me <laughs> I know it. Okay, you know it? Yeah. So for those who, who don't know, plaga means plague. So the irony that we're in a pandemic and we were just kind of feeling maybe a little under the weather because it's been raining here and we were just like, well, you know, what's going on? And we were just kind of like dancing and laughing about it. That little like dark humor. Yeah. Here where I live, like I live in the Midwest and I think that I would have more of a difficult time doing the like the code switching because I still feel like people would be like, oh, you're trying too hard to be Mexican. I'm like, I'm not trying too hard to be anything. This is what I am. Because like when I'm with my parents... My Spanish is not as good as it could be. You know what I mean? Right. So I do normally do the Spanglish thing. And I'm like, ¿Cómo se dice this? ¿Cómo se dice? <laughs> and my dad or my mom or whatever will tell me. And it's just about being comfortable. And it's just weird because this place specifically, and maybe it's because there just isn't a lot of just Latinx people. There's that sense of like, can I really be my authentic self? So. I hear you. I totally hear you. And in my, my family all moved to Miami when I was 21. And so they're all down there. And I mean, they're getting together. You know, they are getting together throughout all this whole time of everything that's happened with the, within the family. And they're all there. They left New York and I was in New York. And now I fell in love and moved to central Pennsylvania. That was a shocker for me. Probably maybe similar-ish to mid Midwest, maybe. In some ways, I'm sure, yeah. The first two places that I moved in, I couldn't hear Latin song to save my life. I didn't see any diversity. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, no puedo con mi vida. And I mean, you know, I was living in Queens, New York before I moved where I could walk to a Peruvian, Colombian, Cuban, five Mexican restaurants, two Turkish, Thai. I could walk anywhere. I know that most of the U.S. is not like that, but that's where I grew up. And so, and my circles were all diverse, all inclusive. Like, it's interesting as people talk about how do we become more inclusive? How do we become more diverse? And I'm like, we've always been like that. Like, that's what it is. The people who want to be like that have been like that. Yeah. You know, redlining is obviously a thing in so many different places. Yes. And so, you know, there there have been structures in place that have not allowed that. But yeah, you're so lucky to be from a place. It's like, I want to be where the brown people are. <laughs> like, where are they? Yeah. Yeah, no, now we're blessed. We just bought a house in the city. And when we go to the supermarket, yes, everyone is here. And it's just like, this is like, okay, this is the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> so it just feels, you know, just more comfortable. This is, it's just, as like you said, and redlining does exist. And, and it's hard. I think that, you know, for me, I support healers who are brown, black, Latinx of all shades, because I really know that a lot of our indigenous wisdom has been taken, you know, repackaged, 
somebody with blue eyes and white skin and blonde hair on the cover and a tunic. And then it's been sold back to us. And, you know, I didn't see them giving a book deal to the lady in Peru who trained them. <laughs> I mean, maybe the lady in Peru didn't want it, or maybe the lady in Mexico didn't want it, or the guy in Mexico, the curandero. But uh, I think it's so important to support that next generation because because it's been overlooked. And I think that now is, I love this time because with so many different forms of technology, you know, it's younger, you know, brujitos can like gain their power <laughs> and they can like use the technology that's accessible to them that they've grown up with, that they've been able to quickly adjust to, to get their message out. And honestly, because I think there have been times where I've been really melancholy in the last couple of like weeks, if not months, if not the whole year, <laughs> you know, but the youth always give me hope. Like I went to a protest earlier this year that was organized by a 16 year old girl where we went to a police officer's house and I was like, these kids are not taking this anymore and we need to like really rally behind them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, we've. I think that we've all been melancholy or sad or, and I think that's what's given me life too, to be like, to see so many diverse faces when I go on Zoom and to have people say out loud, wow, you know, white's a minority here, or wow, like, mira, toda la gente que está aquí, like, they're all, like, so excited, and, you know, I just ask spirit to keep holding that space, because, you know, and trying to make things accessible, like the pay what you can Reiki, and Reiki is a Japanese healing technique, but the truth is that energy healing has been in every culture, just under no name or a different name. And many of our ancestors or even our moms or grandmothers were doing prayers on us or doing healing work that just didn't have a name because it's like how things are done, you know? So I share the Reiki just because it gives us a structure for something we already have. But I think we need to keep seeing more of that and supporting more of that rather than, and this is something I've seen a lot on the professional side of like wellness and spirituality is people leveraging their fame in another area you know, and suddenly doing like a weekend training and being a bruja curandera and suddenly they're like, boom, I'm, you know, I've been doing this. And it's like, you just started last month, which I mean, you could still have a lot of wisdom. I'm not saying you don't, but I think that we also have to kind of move away from that perspective because that's what capitalism does. That's what colonialism does. You leverage the fame you have on one end and then you just keep bringing it into the space without letting other people from other spaces move in or experience it or flow into it. So, oh my god, you just spoke so many truths. And, you know, I have to remind myself sometimes, you know, I think we all do it because, you know, capitalism creates competition uh or it tells us that there's competition when really like at the end of the day, unless you have a very terrible thing or terrible product or terrible intention, I think that you're trying to bring about something that is not only like healing or bring some type of good, at least I think. So, yeah. So when you have those moments of self-doubt, everyone just like, remember, like no one else in the world can make what you can make you do what you can do. Yes. We need everyone too. like, it's so funny. Somebody came to me, I, uh, I think it's like a 22 year old healer. And they're like, I was told that I'm going to be known. I'm going to be known. And I kind of giggled a little bit and I'm like, you know, known isn't like it used to be like known. Isn't what, what, what we used to think of known, like Walter Mercado existed in a time <laughs> where there was no Wi-Fi. Okay. So he had the entry, he was on TV he broke through stereotypes. Well, now we've got TikTok, we got Instagram, we got so many things that are even being created. Like I was telling some students in a few years, I'll probably be teaching through holograms. You know, <laughs> I was like, it's not even going to be through zoom anymore. And so there really is a lot of space for all of us. And that's what brings me hope as well, that before I could only find like a Louise Hay book and I'm not downing her. Uh, you know, I cried when I met her because her book was translated into Spanish and I gave it to my grandma um, when I was in my twenties and I didn't find as many books. I didn't find as many, and I tried really hard and I did dig up some from Latinx people, Latin, Latino people, Hispanic people, we called them back then. And now there's just so many books and so many podcasts and so many things that just makes me, I don't know, just, I just feel really, really happy. And I've told healers when they feel bad, they're like, oh, but I'm doing the same thing the other person. I'm like, no, you're not. You're doing it through your lens, your experience, your life experience, your past life experience, your soul experience. And how many healers can you help? How many folks can you hold? You know, you could do 30 people a week, maybe max. 
that's a big, that's a lot of people to do sessions on. And then you could hold a couple of hundred people in a course. To be honest with you, I don't even want thousands because I like the contact with people. And so we need everybody's light to light up because also healers, we've been taught in the last few years that it's like a a title on your business card or on your website. No, a healer is how you live and breathe. We bring our healing energy in a bakery. We bring our healing energy in a post office. And those are healers too. And so we need everybody. Oh my God. You just said so many amazing things. Oh my God. Thank you so much for being here and sharing this space. Oh, thanks. Thank you, my love. I'm so glad that you're here, that I found you, that you said yes, that we made it through our individual and collective challenges to get here. No, it's great to speak with you and to hear and from your, you know, what's happening on your end and... And I just think we're here to rise and also to go deep into the the earth of our own selves. And it ain't over. Like people say, oh, you started so young. I'm like, girl, I'm, I'm still healing. I'm changing. Stuff is coming up. I'm like, ooh, I didn't know I still had that. Or wow, okay. It's just always that deep invitation to be more of ourselves and to release. And it never ends. It never, ever, ever ends. 100% always be growing, always be becoming better. Well, Vanessa, where can everyone, you know, follow you on social media or you know where can everyone find you on instagram i am at the biz bruja and i am also on a website called the biz and uh, yeah those are the main places there are others but let's keep it simple <laughs> All the information for how you can support Vanessa is in the show notes. And I highly suggest that you do. She just has such a warm and biting energy. All right, everyone. Thank you again for listening. Real quick, before you leave, if this episode or any episode of the show has really connected with you, please let me know. Every once in a while, someone tells me that this opened their eyes in some ways. And also, I really like to know what I can do better. And a lot of people have just been like, yo, something... You know, whether it was a conversation, whether it was a topic, whether it was whatever, just really opened their eyes about their own spirituality and has made them realize that witchcraft isn't evil. Ruhidia is not evil. It is a way of connecting with self. What is evil is bad intentions who hurt people. And honestly, you don't have to be a witch to do that. I think we see that a lot with Catholicism, you know, feeling like you're a part of an elite club and you're better than everyone. I think ego can impact you no matter where you're at. Thank you again. I look forward to our next chat. Have a good one. Bye. Thank mm-hmm. you.